Welcome to AI, Government and the Future, a podcast by Corner Alliance. We explore the intersection of artificial intelligence, government and the future with your host, Alan Pence. We work with government to create results. We ignite your agency's mission by helping you to design and implement high impact and innovative federal programs in AI, broadband, cybersecurity, public safety and more. Being a government ally is at the core of all we do. Introducing your host, Alan Pence. Hey, welcome. Today we have with us Aileen Chaveau. So Aileen, why don't you tell us what you're currently doing and what you've just got done doing. Hi everyone and thank you Alan for having me today. I am right now transitioning between my position as Senior Advisor on Digital Policy and Economic Affairs at the European People's Party and the headquarters in Brussels towards a new position, which I will start very soon at the European Commission at DigiConnect as a policy analyst. So I am in Brussels following a very close EU legislation, but also beyond. Great. And DG Connect is... Uh... So it's the Directorate General of the European Commission that focuses on the communications networks and historically also telecoms. Excellent. That will be helpful for our American listeners. So you've had a pretty incredible journey covering from the early days of the internet up to now, obviously what, what the EU is grappling with with AI. So... Paint a picture for our listeners of how the conversation around digital technologies, and we're particularly interested in AI here, has evolved over the years in European policy circles. There's been this political push when the current commission took office in 2019, when the newly appointed president at the time, Ursula von der Leyen, committing to proposing an AI regulation within the first 100 days of the mandate. And you know, Parliament pretty saw work. In parallel with the Committee on AI, consultations happen with stakeholders. And the idea was to replicate the EU's move to adopt the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which was adopted in, in 2018. It was already touted as a success, as like a blueprint you know, for the world to follow. And it's part of that idea that the EU must carve out a third way between China and the US and could take the lead as a regulator. So I think the recent years have been more of that discourse around digital technology, something that we've learned run free in the past, like with the internet, but that now had to be controlled either through regulation or by enhancing its production domestically, you know, production of technologies. Ideally both, but the EU worried that it wouldn't have what it takes to weigh in with the actual innovation and tech leadership going on elsewhere. So there was a realization of that fear that we're falling behind in the innovation race and losing sovereignty, becoming a digital colony. And, and regulation was supposed to be a recipe to ensure that we slow down that fall. And I think we've come to imbalance in the conversation. So European circles do agree that regulation is needed now, but innovation must be preserved. And you now hear things from ministers that, yeah, okay, for regulation, but you have to be careful not to overregulate and constrain the ability for Europe to develop the technology as well. And that conversation is more vocal than 10 years ago on technologies in general, for sure. There seems to be also a consolidation of the debate around that either you're in favor or against AI. This black and white is an efficient approach, but, you know, we've seen that before. Yeah, exactly. So, and you characterize in between China and the U.S. So, would you characterize, I guess, China as the highly regulated and the U.S. not regulated at all? Is that sort of the conception? Yeah. And in AI, I guess it's kind of hard to know. China, in some ways, wants to keep AI from being too much of an issue for them. So they might actually regulate more. Actually, if you look at China's own rules, part of those actually demand that AI models are like explainable, open to evaluation, and not used for like organized crime. And that's quite similar to the proposals from the US, the UK, and Europe. And much as we don't like to admit it. And at the moment, we are talking, there are things in motion in the U.S. administration to promote safe, secure, trustworthy AI systems. I don't think we can expect something that will be quickly embedded into actual law. You know, it might be a new administration next year. I could reverse everything. And I think it's unlikely that a comprehensive bill on this will be introduced next year. But there are definitely efforts in other parts of the world to regulate. But Europe wanted to be the first, and it wasn't in the need. And now... Things are changing, not just a race to innovation and technology development, but also legislation. So it's becoming from all part. So maybe the EU had this nose to see, okay, this is becoming important. It's trying to be the first. 
And now maybe they're not going to be the first or at least not the only interlocutor around this. So they might not be able to have this AI ad copy pasted everywhere as much as they think. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. So what kind of inspired you personally to jump in the waters here of AI regulation? It's obviously a pretty contentious and complicated topic. That's actually you. The reason you get to learn every day in this field, I will never be fully an expert because there are many other topics I cover and that I must follow. I tried to avoid 5G cybersecurity for a few years, but then it just became so transversal. You need to get knowledge about everything. And it's exhausting, but kind of a bulimic for information. And I do like the complexity in itself and the complexity of the arguments in that conversation around the benefits, you know, the risks of the technology and the hidden interests the political interest, what's at stake politically. So it's a vibrant field. So yeah, it's never bored. Yeah, excellent. And so, you know, we have a long history of new technologies in Europe. We had the printing press, right? And a hundred years of war afterwards, you know, so from the printing press up to the internet, we've had new technologies and we've dealt with them in various different ways. So in your experience working with the EU's digital policy, how do you think the current response to AI's maybe risk the more on the existential side compared to the past reactions to technology revolutions? In, uh, say, the modern regulatory era, like maybe from the 16th or 70s, we did see calls to restrain technological risks already through regulation. And while seeing at the same time competing concerns that regulation could hobble progress and new technology, and technology and regulation are often post as adversaries. So I would say that the reactions are probably similar and equivalent with sometimes two sides confronting each other. But we've also seen it in past phases of tech progress and industrial revolutions. We've seen also deregulation of economic regulations. So in the mid-70s, you could see economic regulations being repeatedly dismantled in this phase. Privatization, deregulation, they came to govern Western perspectives. I think in the U.S., they deregulated airlines, banking, even trucking. And, you know, you had the breakup of AT&T, telephone monopoly. And simultaneously, we also saw the explosive growth of social regulation, you know, with more health and safety rules. So a boost to risk regulation, actually. And then some fears and concerns as reactions to tech advances, uh, tech advances are not new. So you find today what you could call the descendants of the British Judites. Smashing the looms, the automated looms, yeah. Yeah, and now today you have those people calling for attacks on robots. So yeah, the fear of machine replacing human jobs, that's not new. But today, the difference may be that this scale of AI gives it this multiplier impact in many areas of society. And now some choose to focus on the existential risks from the so-called frontier AI, like the more elaborated AI rather than the current capabilities, stuff like AI engineered bioweapons, automated cyber attacks, super intelligent AI systems that we could lose control of. And that's also not new. And now the idea that policymakers have to do something about it, we've never tried to do that in other areas of industry at this stage of a technology and development. So maybe that's new. And some people believe that the imminent threats posed by AI are exaggerated and that regulating AI is too premature. But overall today, most Western democracies, major AI companies, they agree on the need for regulation. So again, we might come to that later. But so that wake-up call, political circles and people were just all seeing how information revolution and social media had started to impact our lives in recent years. So there was a sense that we have to become more intentional about how our democracies interact with what is primarily generated by the private sector, you know, maximizing the good and minimizing the bad. So what rules for the road? I think we're more strongly realizing the transformational aspect of the technology and the government wants and needs to be aware of what's going on. There's a need to know about transparency, having guardrails and then guard technology while preserving innovation for some. It's a difficult balance. But so it sounds to me like one of the things you're drawing out there is that Maybe the experiences with GDPR, or maybe to some extent people see like the cloud and those sorts of revolutions weren't quite regulated as early and social, right? So that's sort of informing the policymaker now saying, hey, we need to get on top of this and not fall behind like we did last time. Is that sort of a sense you get? 
Yeah, I wish I could say yes, yes. We have tech assessments and regulatory impact assessments to assess the impact of new regulations, but we haven't seen much regulatory innovation to devise alternative regulatory designs like test and practice and select the best performing approaches. So even for those sitting in the table right now, it's not even here where they're in the process and the negotiations where they're at, because the text is just for the AI Act, for instance, it's just extremely long and complex. And there is some pushback to believe that we should or could make it a GDPR 2.0 because it's not as simple. Like other countries and regions haven't exactly just copy pasted our stuff. And the lessons learned are that, okay, we've maybe put too much of an assertive burden on companies, but this is not necessarily the discourse. This is not yeah, recognized by the institutions, not all of them anyway, that we should have maybe looked at that first. And the GDPR, sometimes there are a few articles that are not fit to the needs of some technologies that have emerged since the GDPR was written. So AI, blockchain, you know, those things, they, they require a lot of data connection. Interesting. So GDPR is definitely sort of informing this debate, but maybe we haven't learned the lessons yet enough of GDPR. Not enough. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so, yeah, if you think about you're in this intersection between the policymakers and researchers. So is there a disconnect between what the researchers are talking about and looking toward and the policymakers? Sounds a little bit like yes is the answer. Yeah, I mean, that could have helped. For instance, I actually wrote a piece some time ago about that, that there is evidence of a lack of efficiency and innovation in a process of policymaking anyway. In particular, when you have policies designed and delivered, and it's an issue because policies that are poorly designed, they risk being inefficient, and that can negatively impact businesses and, and you know, public organizations alike and enforcement even by authorities. And I already think we have to realize that when policymakers, when they, we, uh, resolution B and the EPP, and they pass a new law, all firms will have to translate it to their tech infrastructure. And that's not always a walk in the park. It can be impractical at best and at worst impossible. So we have to ensure that policies impacting the digital economies will be viable and not just presumably, but also through empirical, technical specifications, investigations. So we would need more formal involvement of more technologies, tech experts in the process earlier than what you see right now. And to give you just a couple of concrete examples, they could be invited to like advise on the feasibility of draft rules give their interpretation to amend current regimes, existing regimes. That could adjust for the evolution of dynamics in the uh, digital economy and design a process to co-create or build new regulatory frameworks. Yeah. Well, they could maybe use AI to regulate AI. Yeah. I'm not sure we'll manage to get that into the brain of policymakers yet, but one day, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, there are probably some specific areas in AI where you could get a deeper understanding that could lead to a more nuanced way of regulating. That must be something that we need to look at and what it can teach us to help us do regulation better. Just like I think you referred to AI helping us make better policy, AI can help us make better regulations, right? Yeah, I mean, I could answer that question in so many ways. I know that there is this idea of deliberative democracy they could use AI tools. I think a bit like Taiwan does with this platform, they basically collect opinions and they use the digital tools out there to even just connect with what the interests and needs of the people are. So using digital tools in public administration to craft regulation, yeah, I think that's something we would ideally want to go for. It would be great to regulate something whose evolution can be predicted anyway. So deeper understanding, sure, but for AI system, it's really hard. So it's worth considering how tricky it will be for our bureaucratic democracies to keep up with a technology that can quite literally teach itself how to change and adapt to its environment. So the argument is regulating too strictly all types of systems that could amount to regulating the uh, airline industry in the 20s, when some types of aircraft, like I think jet planes, they had not yet been invented or at least not fully developed or commercial. And so many to reconcile on both sides of the argument, we have to accept that regulations, to be nuanced, they should integrate some degree of flexibility to phase those advances more efficiently. So yeah, I mean, I think we need to move towards a better understanding, particularly when it comes to AI, to regulate. And we need to actually move faster to come up with mechanisms to make AI governance a reality. Like some sort of transparency reporting or disclosure reporting 
in terms of how a company is acquiring AI or how they're building AI systems, that's a great step to ensure AI is actually in service to the citizens, because in the end, that's one of the purposes of legislation, right? To serve citizens, I think. Right. And it seems like, I think you kind of referred to the international dialogue as converging on some sort of global rules. At least people are talking about it that way. So if we looked at sort of global rules for AI, what would that involve? And what do you think it means for Europe, the US and other countries, you know, in terms of their influence or their ability to innovate those kind of things? If you look at the international dialogue right now, there are a few things maybe for people to know. There are talks for G7 voluntary code of conduct for AI companies. And overall, there are signs of political will to make an effort to come up with global rules or at least norms on AI safety in particular. But one question is whether Western democracies will forge one like coordinated path on AI regulation leaving other countries, especially China, out of the process. And the G7 route, the Hiroshima process, that sort of seems to need Beijing out and other organizations that are helping to shape global norms like uh, RCD, the GPAI, so the Global Partnership on AI. They don't have China as a member, I think. So the direction it's taken, like some people have also proposed some sort of an AI equivalent to the IPCC. So that um, the panel on climate change. You had this UN, that group of scientists that said society or politics for that greater cause. There were political quarrels in there. A lot of the work had first to fall on deaf ears. But the flur of activity right now, it shows that Western nations are converging on AI rule making. And democracies agree a lot more than, than they don't when it comes to AI. But when it comes to evergreen tenets like transparency, high levels of data protection, security, accountability, that we must bail into those complex systems, everyone can agree that those are good things. But just like perspectives differ on how to regulate, what these tenets actually mean differs remarkably depending on whom you talk to. European values are, of course, shared by UK, US, but the US connects AI a bit more with its implications for national security. It's also a lot about how the US can develop AI to compete with China, that's the narrative and the very sure that the U.S. is looking at. And there's some sort of competition about who could be the leader in this debate now. You can see it emerging. It's becoming common to see politicians in your show out their credentials for handling AI, like collaborating with mining comrades, competing to portray themselves as global trendsetters because AI is a sexy topic and they want to be seen as, as responsive. Yeah, exactly. Well, the fastest way to get a budget in the United States is to say, oh, we're falling behind China on that. So that's a good budget request tactic. I'm curious how much of the debate in the EU really is about the concerns of lagging behind potentially on the technology. You sort of mentioned that before, behind in sort of the overall digital race, trying to foster a more vibrant tech ecosystem there. So how do you think policymakers are thinking about balancing that you talk to the Silicon Valley, I think the term techno-optimist has sort of taken over, where they want the government completely out, and then you've got parts of the larger companies, you know, OpenAI, Google, Microsoft, who want the government to come in and regulate based on their interests. So how are people thinking about that in that balance in the EO? So there are concerns from industry, and that's been on the table for a while now, that if you regulate to large, especially foundation models, are uh, general purpose. AI that could have bad effects on the startups ecosystem and it could fuel certain legal uh, ending we see at a time when uh, smaller players they need regulatory stability more than ever so those burdens on obligations red tape complex compliance and rules that could affect nascent startups and their ability to scale because they don't have the resources and the lawyers so even if the AI ads could have some baseline requirements for the dominant market players those that are releasing very powerful models, for instance, when it comes to foundation models, it's not necessarily good enough for European companies. And I think you hinted at that earlier, and I wanted to circle back to that briefly, is it depends what you regulate and how. And I think we're starting to see signs that there are voices regarding that we should regulate this existential risk of AI. 
we're seeing that emerge in the UK, in the EU. I'm not sure that narrative will be something that you will eventually buy into, but there is a conversation happening there. It's a narrative that's pushed about how you should prevent catastrophic harms or stuff that could be caused by AI. And so I do that certain companies are trying to make policymakers approach AI in a certain way that will enable them to get the investor's attention, you know, drive regulatory capture, making it more complicated for startups and smaller firms to comply with certain requirements that would have been set. And if I may just screen that into our talk, existing AI systems that can't demonstrate the harms are more dangerous than maybe the hypothetical sentient AI systems because they're so real. And so we shouldn't get sidetracked and and we should focus on short-term or imminent risks. And that's key because it matters to people daily. I mean, like mundane, real practical, the expression rubber means the road kind of problems like uh, disinformation, cyber attacks, bias, privacy infringement, word displacements. That's more right now. And if we think of generative AI, it's more likely to amplify existing risks than create new ones, I think, in the short term. Yeah, the worry, I think, here in the U.S., particularly in the techno-optimist community, is that we're going to focus on short-term job protection and protection for certain interests that, you know, are going to be upset by AI. Maybe that's other companies that their business model is no longer relevant. And so the worry is, look, there's a creative destruction process that happens, you know, we don't employ like 50% or 60% of Americans were farmers in 1850, and now it's like 1% of the population or something, you know, something to that effect. You know, so I think that's sort of the biggest fear in the United States is that we'll have this protectionist sort of policy regime that will really keep us from realizing the benefits. You know, the future jobs that might be created are not at the table because they don't exist yet. And so I think that's probably the concern here. Yeah, and that's a fair point. And actually, we see that in surveys and calls. We had this year of barometer and things. And I think people, they see digitalization still as, you know, decisive and important for the future. And it has potential, especially for some sectors. But they will see progress. You have trust in digital literacy that's stagnating. And companies and their optimism vis-a-vis technologies, that could easily fade. So enhancing the focus on EU citizens and businesses and what matters to them now, that's essential if you want to send the message through. You need to support them through that transformation. You need to get them on board. And that's just not words that you hear in political speeches. You know, with globalization, a lot of people lost their jobs. And what you see today is the societal pushback against globalization. Whether you understand this or not, or you argue in favor or not, we cannot let the same happen with digital transformation. At least in Europe, we cannot afford this. So we need to acknowledge that gap. We need to equip the people, uh, not just with like connectivity, Wi-Fi, you know, 5G and grid infrastructure, but also by spending more energy on education that will prepare people psychologically and with skills so that they know, okay, labor market challenges, that's not the first time we went through this, but also how to master the technologies and not fear them, but rather trust them and want to study them so they can achieve even more benefits for their lives. And so we really need to pay attention to that and bring digital closer to people's needs. So they don't try to smash the data centers? Exactly. <laughs> we all want to do that every now and then. But uh... I think it's harder than the loom thing, but maybe. So there's really this gap between public perception of technology and the realities of AI development that are going to come. So that's the gap politicians are going to have to overcome. That seems daunting. You know, you talked about the ability of regulation potentially to evolve, right, and have things embedded in it. So like you mentioned, hey, we have bi-wing aircraft and like then we came up with the jet and so the regulations wouldn't have worked. So how can the EU or other governments, for that matter, craft a more forward-looking regulation that's more adaptive like that? Are there some ways that you've been thinking through that that can be done? Yeah, there's a lot of thinking. (laughs) (laughs) Well, two things. I think we kind of discussed it earlier. Consult stakeholders. Don't act in isolation. Have an international dialogue. Don't act out of arrogance, you know, with that Brussels effect thing. Involve technologies. Use the diversity of mechanisms. So things like deliberative governance or democracy, participatory governance, impact assessments, red teaming is often discussed or preferred as an idea. Ensure the consistency and the coordination across the policies that you're adopting for this sector. 
you know, developers, activists, academics who aren't in the centers of powers, I think they're worried that the future we're looking exactly at right now, something with a lack of coordination and governance. And there's a lot of concern that governance will just jump God on, on rules before knowing what to do. And if you have a patch where regulations focused on different priorities, that might complicate what companies and also policymakers are trying to do. The kind of and the main thing is that you notice in the end there's a huge gap between the goals and the reality of these laws. And sometimes when we make policies, we should keep in mind a little bit more that the reason industry hasn't adopted already some solutions is because the solutions is not there yet. Yeah, I yeah, know. That's great. Well, that's awesome. Okay. So when I got the sheet on Aileen, I was reading through all her illustrious work. And in the middle, there was this one career break that I saw. And I was like, what is this? I, this must be a misprint. So I went to her LinkedIn. And sure enough, Aileen is not only an amazing scholar and policy mix, she also took a little career break to work with British Airways. So tell us a little bit about what led you to do that when you learned from it. So it's not because I had some sort of a midlife crisis. I had been working already for five or six years. So I had a good professional experience. I actually really liked my colleagues and my job. I was working at the time in The Hague at the Center for Strategic Studies on security and defense questions, actually, at the time. That was almost 10 years ago. And I just wanted change when I, and I think uh, a lot of people can relate. And it could have been applying to OECD and the typical things. But then one friend of mine said, hey, I'm following this training for Lufthansa, the German airline. What? You have a master's degree. Why would they want people like us? And one day I just applied online to Bridge Airways, not Air France, I'm French, but they didn't recruit. And when the time came that they sent me the application, I followed the process and then I had a yes. And I was like, this feels good. And what I learned was that, okay, you need to like people to do this job. So yeah, sorry, Bridge Airways flight attendant. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Going from making defense policy to... Yeah, people thought I was either brave or crazy. I didn't think I was either of that. I just knew it was going to be temporary and I made the most of it. And what I found is this is a specific species of people and you really need to like others. And it's just very interesting. It's an interesting industry, of course. It wasn't for the travel part. Of course, I'm one place is so it. I don't know. It was kind of a break, not having to do this, just having to take care of myself, uh, seeing beautiful places. And I don't know, I could do it again in a heartbeat. It's always good to know that you have the backup plan. So, and it's a little, you know, nothing wrong with being a flight attendant, but it, you know, you don't have to think probably quite as much. It's just like interacting with people. No, when I arrived in Brussels six years ago, I was just coming out of rich service and I had no idea what the GDPR was. I had no idea what AI was. So I had to learn everything from scratch when it comes to tech policy. So yeah, it really, you think about other stuff. I was still very much into information and news politics all the time, but so uh, yeah. Right, right. Okay, so what's the best route to get on? Like, what does everybody want to do? Cape Town. Cape Town, okay. Is it just because of the what's at the end or is it gives you a long thing and then you don't have to work? It's a long trip. If you're just a regular customer, it's very expensive and you will have to go for two weeks and maybe it's once or twice in a lifetime, but they have everything. They have the sunset, they have the red meat, they have the wine, they have the mountains, they have everything. The climate is great. I went two years ago. I think I was on Lufthansa. Oh, well, no, they're okay. Yeah, BA is a lot better. Lufthansa, I don't <laughs> recommend it. I don't recommend it. No, I could never say BA is like, you know, I'm French. So I still think Air France is the best. <laughs> <laughs> and if they had recruited, you would have worked there, right? So Maybe, but you know, with ifs. Well, the AI world is very happy that you came back after your sojourn. So, Aileen, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much. And we really appreciate it. So thank you very much for having me. It's been an honor to be on your podcast. AI, government and the future is brought to you by Corner Alliance. To find out more about Corner Alliance and how we work with government to create results, visit our website at corneralliance.com and then make sure to search for AI Government Future in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Corner Alliance, thanks for listening.